Donkey Kong music makes a lasting impression, even among people that haven't kept up with gaming after the 90s. The soundtrack excels at speaking to the heart universally, using a rock and roll song structure to design a compelling emotional buildup. The track Mining Melancholy excels on this front, kicking things off with a metallic drum solo that's impossible to look away from. It throws you into the chaos of the mine immediately. Why bother with the drum set if you can just bang on mining equipment? It's fun to find the rhythms embedded in everyday objects, like the musical theater show Stomp. It debuted a couple years before DKC, captivating audiences by banging on things with brooms, newspapers, and the kitchen sink. Hopefully someday they perform mining melancholy on these trash can lids. And any deja vu you're feeling might be because the sound used as the snare drum is adapted from a sound effect in the first game of the minecart hitting the track, which is one of many sounds in the clamor of crashing steel, a drum section so elaborate that at times it takes up to five of the total eight sound channels in a Super Nintendo. We're especially inclined to soak in all this rich detail in the drum part because it's the only instrument in the first 15 seconds. This is quite different from games like Mario, where at the very start of the level, all the instruments are in full force. The kind of song that just screams, this is a video game, jumping into the lead melody immediately. Whereas Mining Melancholy is an audio adventure to be unraveled, with a verse-chorus-first structure that adds musical layers as you progress through the underground. The track's rounded off by a drum intro and a pre-chorus that gives the final chorus more impact. So there you have it. This might as well be a track on a rock album. This format makes the verse's introduction of the bass a mini-event in itself, not just another instrument lost in the mix. and the electric bass gets us that buzzier sound, which is a modern upgrade of the classical upright bass, which is a wooden, natural-sounding instrument used widely in the natural forest environments of the first game. But deep underground, the electric bass is fitting for the man-made industrial environment of the mines. and it shows off the muted bass technique. Instead of letting the notes ring, you sort of stop them soon after they start by applying constant pressure with the side of your strumming hand, or just take a sponge and jam it under the strings. This gives the bass a new agility alongside the enemies and laborers scurrying their way around the dangerous depths. And this smooth bass line supports a subtle chordal motion in a two chord vamp of one and four, but not just any four, because this pair of chords is formed with the Dorian scale, which takes the minor scale and upgrades the six to major. We usually build the four chord by starting on the root four, and then by doing two skips, it tacks on the six and one, which makes for a minor triad chord. But the Dorian 6 upgrade to a sharp 6 turns this into a major triad instead. This powered up 4 chord cultivates a cool, sleek energy in the opening areas. Especially considering what it would have sounded like in the natural minor scale instead. The natural minor scale can get depressing if you're not careful, so Dorian upgrades like these can be a convenient remedy. And there's two chords in this sequence, but this particular combo isn't designed to generate a lot of motion. After all, the 1 and 4 chords both contain the 1, which cuts down on the traveling required to move between the chords. And this lack of motion is also seen in the way the 1 chord takes up most of the measure, with the chord change only occurring briefly on beat 4. So it works out that it moves from chords 1 to 4 on beats 1 and 4, and you have a 1 in 4 chance of getting hit by the fourth hook enemy in the flying section, 
because unlike the first few, it throws the hook right after catching it with barely a cooldown. Very dangerous. When we consider all the notes in the Dorian scale, the two triads we're switching between contain five out of the seven tones, and every other one chord slides the top note up to the seven, with the result that it's touching upon almost the entire scale. So it's less about generating motion, and more so an opportunity to absorb the Dorian sound as an overall cloud of rock dust. And when the song does hit us with very real chord changes in the chorus, it hits extra hard because we had been hanging out for so long in that stationary lobby. These chord changes are purposefully designed to express the natural minor scale in its full glory, which is everything we'd expect in a cavern of minors. Because this purely minor scale derives its identity from the minor third, sixth, and seventh. You can do a whole lot of exciting things just by moving between chords built on roots in this range. It's a busy thoroughfare with a lot of compositional potential. These chords show up in Sonic 3's Ice Gap, in a different order, but achieving a similar dramatic effect. Mining Melancholy delivers these chords as a dose of reality about the mines, hazards of rock dust and machinery, and living altogether deprived of life's sunlight. The bass line was nimble in the verse, but then the chorus levels out the floor by hammering the root note of each chord, forming horizontal lines along the platforms you climb to escape the level. And you probably notice something different about this bass line, because most games bass tend to sound like this. But when this game came out, hearing the bass with this special effect was grounds for a double take. This should be impossible. The Super Nintendo simply was not designed to generate sounds like these. But it did happen thanks to the drive of composer David Wise. The SNES creates instruments by taking a single sound and pitch shifting it to create all the different notes in the scale. But this process doesn't leave room to layer on effects like cutoff frequency modulation, which at the time was created on electric bass synthesizers like these. David Wise maneuvered around this limitation through the use of direct recording samples. The SNES can play compressed recordings of anything. That's how some games were able to use voice clips. Well, are you still playing this thing? The trade-off is that these samples take up considerable storage space in the game. Wise took a true recording of the squelchy bass line and captured it in the form of tiny samples. Playing them in sequence on the hardware generates this seamless frequency modulation effect. He's poured this kind of creative innovation into numerous soundtracks and genres, and prior to composing for games, he'd aspired to become a famous drummer turned songwriter, like Phil Collins of the rock band Genesis. This is evident in the very Phil Collinsy tracks he composed for DKC2. Phil's most iconic song is In the Air Tonight, which draws out a long dramatic build with this subdued beat. A strikingly similar beat made its way into the swamp theme, Bayou Boogie. And in the air tonight's legendary moment is the over-the-top drum fill at the very end of this three-minute slow build, launching into the eponymous lyric. And Mike Tyson must love the equivalent drum fill in Mining Melancholy. but we can only guess whether Mike would be amused or outraged after the final boss, when the game takes a jab at Sonic. But anyone can enjoy these upward arpeggios.
It's a lot of rapid notes in quick succession, but they don't get in the way because every single one of these notes is either one, three, or five. That's all the ingredients of a one chord, making this arpeggio very stable and motioning the player upward toward the mind's exit. But it's not gonna be a cakewalk, cause a diamond mine's not really a place you go for a happily ever after. And when the chord changes get going, the song does what it can to deny the listener a straightforward resolution on the one chord. You can see this part of the chorus does end on the one chord, but with the extra baggage of adding the nine at first. It seems like there's always one more boulder you gotta clear out of the way. And in the second run through, we don't even reach that point because the last measure is cut off entirely, instead shoving us back into the verse without warning. The mines wait for no one, so you better keep up or else get crushed by equipment or collapsing caves. Later on though, the final chorus provides the full uninterrupted conclusion, keeping that last measure intact. This section is the emotional core of the coal miner's lament, using a solemn lead instrument that almost resembles a human voice, a choir of despondent laborers holding out hope for a better tomorrow. But when we do finally arrive at that conclusive one chord, the news is not good. That's it, the final statement, there's no hope, no path to get out, this is the reality of life in the mines now. Diddy might escape, but the eternal march of the daily grind continues underground. But at least you have the song's drum beat to keep up your energy. That is, unless you're in the Game Boy Advance version of this level, which tries its hardest to recreate the metal clamor by using a cowbell and a tambourine hi-hat thing. But nothing can touch the original with its deliberate use of echo, a technique seen widely on consoles of this generation. The SNES sound chip has a dedicated module that duplicates an instrument, decreases the volume, then nudges that forward for the delay echo. For example, here's how the snow level percussion sounds alone, then with the echo added. but Mining Melancholy's delay offset is only a quick 16 milliseconds. Compare that to the 48 millisecond echo delay of Hothead Bop and In a Snowbound Land, a longer echo cycle that works in the more open environments of those levels. But the mines require a briefer echo as you slink through the cramped and claustrophobic underground. The first level you hear this track is Cannon's Claim, a play on the mining term claim which is a parcel of land on which someone asserts a right to develop and extract a mineral deposit. And you already knew that. But the French version of the game has a different name for this level. La Complète de Canon. Which translates to Cannon's Complaint, perhaps in anticipation of the complaints from players who spent hours looking for the DK coin, all to find it was actually in the bonus stage all along. But there weren't any complaints about this game's music or the graphics. Between David Wise, Rareware, Phil Collins, and Stomp, that's an impressive showing by the land of the big red bus, 